Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome back to our midweek service. You know, I find myself every time I go back and listen to my messages, I don't know, man. Sometimes you kind of get comfortable with something and it's always welcome, welcome back. I don't know what that whole welcome, welcome back thing is. It's almost like Jesus would very rarely, I tell you, or truly, truly. It's like that double saying it. It's making sure you guys are with me, you guys are awake, you guys are, are connecting. I don't know, subconsciously, I think it does something for me. But either way, I am so glad you guys are here tonight as we are on the home, home stretch. Uh, There's only a couple more chapters in this book, and man, we're going to wrap it up. And it's been uh, an amazing, amazing time. And, you know, like I said last week, and and, and some of you guys, um, I know I probably came down hard on you guys, or the message seemed a little harder than some of the other ones, but I I just felt this necessity to really share my heart with you the way I did last week, because I have this conviction when I read the Word of God, and and this week was no different in chapter 9. It's like the Lord is just continuing to build on, you know, just my heart, the condition, and how we need to move forward in this new year as we are, you know, eight weeks, nine weeks into it. You know, it doesn't seem that long, but, you know, we just celebrated New Year's and many folks made New Year's resolutions and those New Year's resolutions are out the window already because, you know, sometimes they only last a few weeks. Some of you guys are still with it and this is good. And I just pray that as we're going through this book, you realize that God is speaking and moving and, he, and he's encouraging us to come back if we have fallen off. And, and the reason why I said last week too, I encourage you guys to get into a Bible reading plan because it's amazing how what we landed on today in this portion of scripture and where we are today, as you know, today's the first day of Lent, which is the 40 days leading until Easter. And, and I believe that look, thinking about that and what Lent is and where we are in this portion of um, the book, uh, in this book of uh, Nehemiah, it almost lines up very similar because where they're in this place where they're praying, they're worshiping, they're repenting, they're fasting, they're, they're crying out to God and they're reminding themselves of God's promises and where he has been throughout their whole history, going back to Abram and to where they are now and the condition along the way. And it's kind of like this remembrance. And that's what we do. We kind of, you know, crucify our flesh during this time. We, some of us fast, you know, and we get ready and prepare for that, that, that moment of Easter where Jesus walks out of the grave triumphantly, but we think about that rugged cross at Calvary that, you know, has the blood stains that was given for me and for you. And this is what we need to think about because it's awesome when we think about how God is moving in our lives and how he's rebuilding parts of our lives, just as we see in the story of Nehemiah, the walls being built up and the people coming back. This is great when we see these things, but if, if, if we don't work hard to keep the work that has been done uh, in the place that it's in, it's easy to revert back. And we all know people like that, right? And I, and I want to caution you guys because sometimes when things are going well, just as it is in this situation, it's easy to just think we can coast the rest of the way. Like put it on cruise control, we're good. We've already accomplished building these walls. That was a big task. And I just want to point you to say, no, don't just kind of get off the gas, but really press in. Because we see that revival breaks out in Jerusalem and the people are, are, are all for it. But we know Israel's history. We know that this doesn't last long, right? Because they find themselves reverting back. And that's the same with us. The condition of the church is a real danger of, of seeing this great move of God and just kind of sitting in that moment, sitting in that time and enjoying it, but not continuing to press in and we fall back. And the fact is that we've seen folks like that. We see folks who slide and when they slide, they slide further than where they were originally. And here's the thing, right? That when you think about this, we need to ensure that we don't end up that way. Or if we see someone that's sliding, that we precaution them and we warn them as much as we can not to go back. Because if they go back, oftentimes they go back further than where they were. And, and see, that's the thing that I want us to understand because this portion of scripture points us to that. It really helps us and it highlights the faithfulness of God to the people of Israel. And if we know he's faithful to them, we know he's faithful to us because we are his people, you know, and we, once again, we see them gathering, confessing, worshiping, all of this is happening in this moment in time. And what I love about this is that we're going to see this condition throughout and we're going to see how Nehemiah, Ezra, and all of them are, are pointing the church in the direction they need to go. And I pray that you, I'm not putting myself in Nehemiah's shoes or Ezra's, I'm not a prophet, but as your pastor, you, you will see the importance of what God is doing here and what he's doing here in our midst. 
because some of you guys who call Upward Home that you hear, you kind of know what's going on. God is doing an amazing move right now in this church. And sometimes we don't see that or we take it for granted. And I don't want that to be the case. You know, I want the reality is that this will be a daily way of living, that this will be a daily habit of coming in, gathering together, praying, worshiping, periodically fasting, that we don't just read these scriptures in here, be moved for a season and that's it. Like this is our life that we live every day. You know, Lent's a great time to remember and reflect these 40 days, but think about what Christ has called us to do. Think about what the Apostle Paul has said, even in Galatians. When we went through that Galatians series, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 24, he says, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. So because we are in Christ, we crucify that old habit. We don't want to go back there. So the desires, the flesh, the things of the flesh, we say no to those things. So even though we have this season of time where we remember, this should be a constant lifestyle of ours. Paul says it in Romans 8, 13. He goes, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all those who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. There's something I want us to kind of think about here with the scripture here. If you look at it, it says, if you live according to the flesh, this is a present verb that's happening right now. It's not like if you lived, it's if you live according to the flesh. That means if you're currently living this life, being all in the world, designing the things of the world, it says you're going to die. But if you live, right, by the spirit, meaning we have this active relationship, we're constantly in fellowship with God. It's not like I come to him when I need him. No, we're with each other every day. When I do this, the spirit leads me. And because the spirit that dwells in me is the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, it says that we are also called sons of God because we are in relationship with the father. It's not an estranged relationship. He's not a stepdad, right? that he comes only on the weekends to pick us up or something like that. No, we are in relationship with him every day. So in order for us to constantly make this relationship work, and I titled this message, Making It Last, we're going to get into the scriptures today to see what we have to do in order to make that relationship, to make that habit of continuously living in relationship, crucifying the flesh, living according to the spirit. What do we got to do? And the first thing, if you guys are note takers, I really have only two main takeaways with a few sub points. The first takeaway, if we're going to make it last and not revert back to a way of we used to live, but live constantly in this pattern of living and crucifying and and living in the spirit, we got to take care of today. That's number one. We have to take care of today. And as we see here, it says, if you live, it's a present thing. We take care of today. If you have your Bibles with me in Nehemiah chapter nine, I'm going to open up in verse one through three. And it says here, now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. Let me pause there because you're probably thinking, what is this? What's going on here? Let me paint this picture for you and what's going on here. So remember, the city where the walls were built up. Last week we read in chapter eight, they're reading the scrolls. They're going back to the festivals and the commandments that God had commanded his people to live by. And now they're in this place on the 24th day after everything's been rebuilt and they're celebrating and they assemble and they're fasting and they're wearing sackcloth. Now, sackcloth, when you would see someone wearing sackcloth in mourning or fasting, it was a sign of mourning, of crucifying their flesh, except they were showing it out externally. They had the sackcloth, it was mourning, and then when it says dirt on the head, it's because they wanted to be lower than the dirt, understanding they're putting themselves in a position that's lowly. So they're mourning, they're putting themselves in a low position because they understand that they serve a great God and everything that they've done has always tried to exalt themselves above that, and they want to show that, Lord, I am crucifying my flesh. Lord, I am putting to death the desires that I want. I am foregoing food and letting my flesh cry out for what it wants, but what it really needs is more of you. And I'm going to lower myself and and, and kind of get away from the things that bring pleasure to me. So this is this picture that's being painted here. And it says in, in, in chapter verse two, and the Israelites separated themselves from the foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. So not only did they confess their sins, but they talked about generational sins, the sins of their fathers. Hey, you know what? I don't know what my dad has done, but I'm going to confess those sins because I'm not that person. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. You know, my wife and I got saved. There were some things that we knew that when we came to Christ, we were new creations, but there were still these lingering thoughts and ideas and, and habits that we were like, why are these things continuously creeping up? And 
And I remember we began to pray and fast and the spirit of God began to show us these generational things that some of them we didn't even know were issues in our families until we began to just write them down and say, Lord, I don't know why this is coming up, but I'm writing it down. This is not going to affect me or my family moving forward. Later on, we found out that these were issues that my family and her family were dealing and struggling with. And and I'm so grateful for this because I didn't even know the word like this. We just knew that God was doing something in us and we didn't want to associate with those things. It's beautiful when the Holy Spirit just shows you these things. And then later on, you find it in scripture and you're like, oh, it was always there. You know, but as a baby Christian, God has a lot of grace and mercy for us. We make a lot of mistakes along the way and he helps us figure it out. But this is what they're doing. They're, they're calling out those sins of the past, of their families, of their relatives, and they're canceling those things. And they're saying, nope, that's not going to come across my family moving forward. We're breaking generational curses. And this is what's happening here in verse three. And they stood up in the place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord, their God, for a quarter of the day. And for another quarter of it, they made confession and worship the Lord their God. Now, an average Jewish day was a 12-hour day from sunup to sundown. So a quarter of a 12-hour day is three hours of reading the Word of God. So we start at 7. We'll be done around 10 o'clock reading the Word of God tonight. And then we're going to worship and pray for another three hours because that's a quarter of it. I'm only messing with you. I was saying like, yo, PJ, I'm out of here in 30 minutes like when you're done. But the reality is there was no sense of time. You know, I think about those long-winded preachers that I used to sit under sometimes when my, I would go to visit a cousin's house. And my, my he, <laughs> this was a setup, I tell you. You know, you know how it is with cousins. You always want to plot, hey, whose house are we going to sleep over? I sleep over your house. You ask your mom, and she's not going to say no to you if you ask. You know, and then you go over there, and you realize you went to the cousin's house whose mom wanted to go to church on Sunday. And so that means you were forced to go to church on Sunday. <laughs> But you didn't know what you were getting yourself into. And my mom was like, oh, you want to go to that sister's house? Go ahead and go. Because she knew what was up. And we would get there at 8 in the morning. And then it's about 1130 and we're still there. And we're thinking like, all right, you know, he's wrapping up. They got the last song. We're like, oh, we leaving. He's like, nah, man, we're going downstairs to the basement. I said, for what? He goes, they're going to serve us lunch. I said, okay, cool. They're going to give us lunch. Then we get to go home. He goes, oh, no. The pastor's going to get his sustenance that he needs because we're going to go another two, three more hours. I said, bro, but it's almost going to be five o'clock by the time we get out of here. Like, I got things I got to do. I got school on Monday. He's like, yeah, I'm sorry, man. And that was the one cousin that really never had no one go. No one went over there to sleep over. We always asked him to come over. But there was no sense of time. These people loved it. And, I, and as a kid, seeing that, and especially as a kid that didn't believe in God, I'm thinking to myself, like, hey, you really can worship God this long? Like, how much more does this man got to say? But now that I'm following the Lord and I love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, I realize that, man, time, when you're connected with God and you're connected to the life source, that time just seems to stop. And then as you know, you find yourself two hours later in his word, praying and just, man, spending time with Jesus. And you're like, man, where did the time go? And eternity is going to be like that. There's going to be no sense of time where we're just going to sit at the feet of Jesus and worship him. And this is what they're doing. Three hours of reading the word and three hours of confessing. Six hours of just being in the presence of God. And and the thing is, if we want to endure our struggles in life, we need to have that kind of time with God. This is what it's showing me, right? Because when we look at this, there's a lot that happens in this little three verses. Uh, And things that we want to ensure a strong future of the church, it it doesn't happen if we think that far ahead, if we don't think about the here and now. You know, oftentimes we want to think about what God's going to do a month from now, six months from now, a year from now. But God is telling us, hey, don't worry about tomorrow, but worry about today. What are you doing now? You know, we want to see God move in our midst. We want to see God move in the church. But yet we're not doing anything now to prepare for that. And God is saying, why do you want me to send revival then if you're not even preparing yourself for it now? If you want revival, then act like it now. Live for it now. Don't just wait for it to happen and roll the dice and pray, hope that it happens next month or whatever long it happens or whatever camp meeting you find where you can sit there for the next three weeks and just get caught up. God's saying, live that way every day. And this is what they're seeing here. They have been so far away from the presence of God as exiles. And now they're back and they're saying, wow, we have a place to worship God freely in our own city, the city of God, in the city of Jerusalem, the city of David. And they're like, man, we just want to stay in this presence. And this is what they're doing. They're focusing on today, not tomorrow. That's why the time doesn't bother them. But the reality is many of us have to go to work. Many of us have to go back into the real world. But it doesn't mean that we have to just stop what we do with God in the presence. We take that with us everywhere we go. If we don't care about today, then we're not going to have a future. If we don't think about the church here and now, we don't, what kind of condition or church we're going to leave for future generations. I'm looking around this crowd right now. There's a lot of young people. 
and I mean young people like early 20s and I mean like teenagers and even younger, there's a lot of you guys in here and you guys are the hope for the future, but it starts now. It starts now with you showing a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Because if you're just going to go and do the same things that your friends are doing, then you can't expect God to show up and answer these prayers when you find yourself in crisis. Because God's like, oh, now you need me, huh, sugar daddy? God doesn't want that. Can he move like that? He can if he has to. But that's not what he's calling us, especially now when you are being warned and God is speaking to you. And I hope speaking to you through me that you will understand that it's not me saying this to you, but it's God preparing his church and waking us up now while there is still time. And he's saying, hey, take care of now. And there's some things and some components about taking care of today and what it looks like. And I want to give you a list based on what I just caught in those three scriptures. You might be thinking, you got a list off of three scriptures? Yeah. So if you guys are note takers, here's my first thing. The component of what we need to do today to worry about today so that we can see God move tomorrow. And the first thing is it starts with confession. We need to confess and not hold things inside. You know, I think sometimes we think as we come to church and we have struggle, we don't want to tell nobody because we don't want them to think negatively of us. We don't want them to think poorly of us. So we keep things inside and what happens is the condition gets worse and worse and worse. It's like if you buy a piece of meat, it's fresh, but if you put it in the fridge and you don't freeze it and it sits there for a while and you say, I'll get it to it tomorrow. I'll get to it tomorrow. I'll get to it tomorrow. I've done that. And like a week later, you think, oh man, I got that steak and let me go pull that out. And you open that package up and it smells and it's rancid and it's nasty and you got to throw it away. And then you think to yourself, man, I just spent all that money on that thing, man. And I got to throw it away because you procrastinated. You thought, oh, I'll eat it tomorrow, but something came up. And God is saying the same thing. We got to confess those sins because if we leave it in there, it just rots and gets nasty. And to the point where it finally does come out, it's worse than what it was if we were just taking care of it right away. But we need to go humbly before God and let him know to clean our hearts up every day. Every day. Come to him every day at the end of your day. Because I'm sure there's some things that you've done or said or thought that you didn't think were that bad. But God's like, yeah, that's a sin. Yeah, I don't like that. Yeah, Yeah, that doesn't line up. That doesn't meet my standard. And because of that, we fall short of the glory of God every day. And because of that, God just says, you know, I have grace for you. But if we don't constantly have this life of repenting and confessing to God, these sins begin to pile up in our lives. And we ended up right back where we started, or if not worse. So let's live a life of constantly confessing and repenting our lives, which leads to the next component if we're going to make it count is to repent, but I'm sorry, confess and live holy or live holiness lives. Now, I know you don't want to hear that word in this day and age, you know, but this is a holiness church. You know, we believe in holiness. Holiness meaning being set apart. And that's the thing that sometimes we don't want to be set apart, but God is holy. And he says, be holy as we should be holy as he is holy. So if we are called to be holy, holy means to be set apart. We separate ourselves from the world and the ways of the world. If you notice here in the scripture, it says the Israelites separated themselves from all the foreigners. In other words, they say they're going to take away my time from being with the world and I'm going to get into the house of God. These were all believers gathered together. These were, this was a believer session while they were confessing. These were confessing around believers. Because You know what? Repentance has to come in the house of the Lord first. Discipline comes to the house of God first before it goes everywhere else. If the house of God is not living right, God's going to judge here before he does it out there. We, we think to ourselves, look at what's going on in the world. Lord, just strike them, smite them. All right? But God's like, I'm going to smite you first. <laughs> Because you are my example to the world. You are supposed to be the light to the world. And you're not doing what you need to do, so therefore you will get the smiting first. Smitten, smiting them. I don't know if I'm using the right contents. I'm not an English major. But we need to start living separated lives. Because if we're living with the enemy, we'll end up where we started. We'll end up a friend of the enemy rather than a friend of God. And this indicates that this gatherers of believers understood that they had to get their lives right. You ever notice somebody who slips away from God, they backslide? We're so quick as a church to correct them and bring them in, right? Or try at least, but sometimes they don't want to receive. They get mad, they get all upset. Who are you to judge me? Well, I mean, we're in the church. We're supposed to judge one another. We're supposed to judge righteously amongst one another so that when we get out to the world, we can present Christ to them. But what happens is they slide away and we try to pull them back and they don't want to hear it. But what happens is... Because everyone knows that they were a church-going person, now the world sees them, and then the world calls them out. And that's far worse. 
Because when the world calls you out, they know that there's a standard you should be living by, and you're not living by that. Yet the church, when we call you out before it gets to that point, you get upset. And the question is, man, I want somebody, a brother or a sister in the Lord to call me out before I get called out by the world. Because if I'm being called out by the world, that means the world sees my hypocrisy. They see my double standard, my double life. And the Bible says a double-minded man is not stable. So therefore, we need to make sure that we live holiness lives set apart. When the world calls out the church, that's terrible. When I hear things happening and I see these documentaries about the church, it hurts me because I'm still a part of the bigger overall church, the universal church. So that means that we as a church are not doing our job in calling out those who are in the church. That's why I love the series we did, How the Mighty Have Fallen, because it's a wake-up call for the church. We've seen many men and women of God in the last couple of years fall because of infidelity and just, you know, lapses in judgment. And what happens is it affects all of us because now other people look at these leaders in the churches and churches that are sound churches and they look at them with a, with an eyebrow raised up like, hmm, when is the shoe going to drop on you, right? They're just expecting that because we're so close to looking like the world. You know, man, I, I don't know. You might see PJ coming in here with a suit and tie every Sunday moving forward. I don't know. I'm just saying. That's my tradition. I'm sorry, right? We used to come from a church like that every Sunday. Worship team used to be in their suits and ties, getting it in. Because we wanted to live set apart lives. But my thing is like, what, are we going to Wall Street? Like, what, what's going on here? Like, is this church? I don't know. Somebody's going to have a problem with it. So you can never please anybody. But I just want to make sure that when you see me, you see Christ in me. And I'm living set apart. That's all. You know what I'm saying? Because if we're trying to get to this place where we have lasting revival, lasting presence of God and making it last, we don't want to go back to the old ways, which we shouldn't. Which leads me to my next portion. And what we see here is they confess, they live set apart lives, and they worship God. And this part becomes easier when we do the first two. When we repent, we have clean hearts and we live set apart lives, it's easy to worship God. It's in those moments when you're not living set apart, when you're not living a life that's up and up with everybody and you have the hidden sins where it's hard for us to raise our hands and worship God. And I know, I, I've seen those people who come in here with a reckless abandon worship and they're in the front row getting it in, but then all of a sudden something happens in their life and they're sitting in the middle. Then they're sitting in the back. And then the church attendance is kind of erratic to the point where you don't see them no more. And you're like, hey, what happened to so-and-so? Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen them. It's because sin had been piled up and, and because they hadn't confessed it and because they weren't sitting, living set apart lives, it became more difficult for them to worship because they feel like God is going to judge them in a way that God's saying, I'm merciful. I'm loving. Just come to me. And we see that here in this story. We see that in Nehemiah's case that God had punished him for a time, 70 years, but he was calling them back. And it's the kind of God that we serve. We don't want to get so busy that we stop worshiping God. And that happens sometimes. We allow the cares of this world, we allow life to happen that pulls us away from worshiping God the way we should worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's what he's looking for, true worshipers. But I'm telling you, if we don't get those first two right, the third one becomes so hard, so hard. John 4.24 says this, God is spirit and those who worship him must, this is not a suggestion, this is not, a, you can, must worship in spirit and in truth. So there's a way of worshiping God that God is requiring. Now, it's not just simply coming in here, hearing a few tunes and clapping our hands and raising our hands and man, that was a great song that the worship team led us in. No, worship goes beyond that. It's not just the songs, it's our life. It's how we conduct ourselves, the way we speak to one another. That's worship and that's what God is looking for. He says, you must worship him in spirit and in truth and not compromising. Galatians 2.20 says this, that I have been crucified. This is Paul speaking, but he's given us the example of how we should live. I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean, crucified with Christ? Denying the flesh, the cares of the flesh, the desires of the flesh. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. Notice it's in the Son of God, not with, in, because the Spirit of God lives in me, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is important here, why worship is so important. Because we're not worshiping God for who he is, but we're also worshiping God for what he has done. Yeah. Remember, we are supposed to be the ones on that cross. Our sins should have been nailed there, but Jesus says, no, I'll take the, I'll take the penalty. Like you were in court. And they had all the evidence stacked against you. And the court, the judge is ready to rule on it. He's calling the jury, says, does the jury have the decision? And they're like, yeah, Your Honor, we do. And all of a sudden, at the last minute, someone comes in and says, Your Honor, I know the decision's been made, but whatever punishment he's going to get, I'm going to take it. That's what Jesus does, and you get to walk out free. 
And this is what Paul is saying. Because of that, I worship him because of what he has done. Not just who he is, but what he has done. And he lives in me now because of that. And that's why we worship him. I think when we start to think about that and what Jesus has done for you and for me, man, no one could ever, ever take that place. No one ever, ever can compete with his worship because of what he's done for me. I love my kids. I love my wife, but I don't worship them. I'll give my life for them. But Jesus gave his life for me. And it shows that the level, like I can only give them but so much human love, but God is so much bigger than that. And he deserves so much more than that. What you give your car or your house or whatever you value, God should be way above that. And this is what Paul is telling us. That's why he crucifies himself daily with Christ because he understands what Christ had to do to take that cross to Calvary for me and for you. Which leads me to my next point within that second one there is to remember a remembrance. This is what the people of Israel were doing. They were remembering the times. And if you read this whole passage, I would read it, but it would take about 10 minutes to read it. And I, I have so much time. Um, but I encourage you to go back and read it. They go back to the history of Abraham when God called him out of Earl of the Chaldeans. And he goes on to how he brought in Moses as that leader, as he brought in all of these different kings and judges along the way to lead and shepherd God's people. They're just talking about all of these things. They're remembering. They even remember when they fall away and how God has called them back. This is what they do. They remember and we need to do the same thing. And it's important that if we want to live for today, we need to remember what God has done for us yesterday because that's what's gonna draw us to move forward, but about the here and now. And that's what we see throughout chapter, verses five through 37. They're remembering all the milestones in history. And they don't remember the milestones to have a pity party. I don't want you to think about the milestones in your life that God has done for you to have this pity party. Oh, I'm not where I used to be, man. God was so good to me when I first got saved. Every prayer I prayed, God just answered it. Now he's not answering any of my prayers, man. I just don't hear from him. You know what? That's good that he's not answering every single one of your prayers. That means you're off the milk. Because when you're on the milk and you get saved, I mean, I tell me, trust me, every prayer I pray when I got saved, it seemed like the Lord was coming through. And I was praying prayers that was selfish. I had nothing to do with God. Like, y'all know I'm from Boston. So I, the Red Sox hadn't won a World Series in 86 years. And that was one of my prayers when I got saved in 04. I'm like, Lord, if you're real, can you make my team win this World Series? Like, I would just love to see a championship in my day. And they, got, they won the World Series that year. And I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, I'm Jesus' favorite. <laughs> like, why didn't anybody else pray like this for 86 years? I'm thinking that. And obviously now I'm old and I realize that's just not how it works. But hey, to me, I was, I was floating on a cloud and I would pray all these other prayers and God would move. And now that I'm old, I realize that's, that's not how it works. <laughs> but Lord, I thank you for having grace and, and being merciful and even having a sense of humor with me when I was still a babe. Because now that I'm mature and I've walked with you for a while, I realize that when I pray and I don't hear from you, it's okay. Because you don't stop being God. You don't stop sitting on the throne. I'm reminded of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego when they're sitting and getting ready to throw in, throw in the fiery furnace and they tell Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to worship you because our God is bigger than you. And even if he doesn't come through, we will not stop worshiping him. That's the kind of faith that they had. And I love that. I love that. There's two main reasons why we need to remember where we started, right? The first one is we remember where we started because we learned from our past mistakes. I don't pray like that anymore, okay, y'all? I don't want y'all to think that PJ still be praying about team stuff. I mean, my kids sometimes do. <laughs> And I love it because I'll, I'll agree with him because I'm still a sports fan, but that's not how it works. It doesn't answer. But, you know, God reminds me of those past times and the mistakes that I've done. And he says, look, just don't do those things again. But another second thing is we need to remember how good God is, right? For he is the God of the second chances. I've blown it so many times. And the fact that I'm standing here right now preaching to you, and if you knew my life when I first met the Lord in 04 to where I am now, there was a lot of mistakes along the way. And I'm just so grateful that God has still chosen me. Like you said, Millie, second, third, fourth, fifth mistakes. Lord, I'm sorry. And God's like, I got your back. Don't worry about it. You're my kid. You know, I love you. And because of that, God wants us to succeed. And he does everything he can to help us in that process. That it's easy to go transition to this next part of my ways of kind of being, living for today. It's living in obedience. It becomes that much easier to live in obedience when you know God is good and you know he's faithful. You know his word is solid. That you can stand on that any day, any time that he's always going to come through. See, if we're, if we're obedient to his word, there's this need to live a life of committed, being in commitment to him and living our lives surrendered to him. Because we see that there's a blessing that comes with living under his word. The Bible says that in obedience, you eat the good of the land. But it's when we walk outside of that obedience is when we start to find ourselves 
in, in trouble. Samson, anybody? You know, God told him exactly what he needed to do, and yet Samson was weak because he had a little desire for the flesh, didn't live in obedience all the time. But even in his last moments, he says he cries out to God while his eyes are gouged out, and he says, Lord, just give me one more chance to destroy these Philistines. His life perished in the process, but God came through for him. In order for us to make it last, we need to do these things. We need to live this way. And it takes me to my second point, and this is my last one. We need to make an investment into the future. We think about the today. Now you might be thinking that's kind of contradictory. No, we think about today for us, because once we get today right, then we can make an investment for the future. And I know this sounds strange, and y'all stay with me for a second here, because I know it seems like, wait a minute, you were just focusing the whole last 30 minutes on today. But there are people around us who can sometimes settle. And you've seen them, you know who they are. They settle, and it's because it makes sense for them. But God's saying, no, I wanna do extraordinary things. And we can't just sit and be comfortable and wait for a trumpet to sound. That may not happen in your lifetime. And what happens if it doesn't happen in your lifetime? Are you just gonna be known for somebody who just sat waiting for it? Or are you gonna be one who sits and makes an investment for the future? Because there's still kids here, there are still young adults here that need a church that's gonna be healthy, that they can continue to take the baton and move forward. And the reason why this is so hard and it's a necessary change for us and even for the church today is because we don't sometimes care about the future. We care about the here and now. Easter's coming up. And can I just be honest with you? I've, I've, I've kind of done a bunch of Easter Sundays now. And that's kind of our big game, our big day for the church. I mean, just the, and every time that day gets closer, I start to hear, Pastor, how many services we're going to have? How's the parking going to be outside? Have you figured out if we're going to be able to park somewhere else? Because I don't want to be triple parked and be stuck here. If we're going to have all these services. Do you know if we're going to have enough coffee for the coffee bar? Should I come to first service? Because I mean, second service may not have. You know, people start to, and I'm not talking about my leader. I'm just talking about people in general. That they want the comforts that make them feel like this is secure. And all of a sudden they come in and somebody's in their seat and they say, hey, pastor, can I talk to you? And I'm thinking it's something serious. I'm like, yeah, what's up? What's going on? Somebody's in my seat. I'm like, what you mean somebody's in your seat? I don't know who they are, but they're in my seat. I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know what you want me to tell you. You should have got here earlier, right? What you want me to go over there and tell me? Excuse me, sir, ma'am. Uh, this seat belongs to uh, this saint over here. Well, I don't see their name. I know they didn't give towards that seat. Saints of the old probably labored and, and, and invested so that they can have a seat here now. But this is their seat, I guess, you know. And, and it, this is the kind of things that what happens, right? We, we think about today. We don't think about the future. But as you lie sit in this church right now and you look around, you're sitting in a comfortable seat, you're sitting in this building, you know, I'm fortunate and blessed enough to still be here with a lot of the saints who were here when this was an, a church down the street, another little building. And, and when they purchased the one that's next door, the kids church, and as they expand it, I get to hear all the stories from Mr. Ralph and he tells me, and I'm just thinking to myself, like, well, praise God for those saints that, you know, saved up and bought the little houses around here and began to expand so that we can have this comfortable church that we live in and worship in and, and get to worship God freely for what they had worked hard because they saw the future and they invested in it. The question is, what are we doing now to invest for the next generation that's gonna be here 20, 30 years from now, long after you and I are gone, you know, and these seats are no longer <laughs> viable to be seats to be sitting in. Like, what is someone else gonna be sitting in when they come in? That's what I think about, I don't know about you. But this is how we do. We have to change our attitude and become this way of, I'm going to die to my flesh today so that somebody else can receive the blessings that God has. I'm going to plant the seed today for whose tree I will not enjoy the shade of, but somebody else will be able to sit underneath it and enjoy the shade of that tree. That's the kind of legacy in life I want to live. And that's what we should have that understanding. These young people here, I want to leave a church that is far better than the one that we are in right now. But it starts with us living like these folks with a reckless abandon. You know, between chapters 10 through 12, we see them making vows and where they're ensuring that the city of Jerusalem will be healthy and godly. They make vows to say, hey, this is what we're going to do. And I'm going to give you the four vows and then I close. I know I said that five minutes ago, but I'm closing for real. The people made four vows, and these are the four vows, and we'll get into them as we get into the later chapters, but I want you to be thinking about this as we get into it. But this is what they vowed to ensure that they will have success moving forward. The first one that they vowed to was to submit to God's word. 
Can you imagine if the church today makes that commitment today to submit to God's word? Despite what it may feel like, despite what it may look like, I'm going to submit to God's word. Even when it makes me feel uncomfortable, even when it's not popular in the culture, I'm going to submit to God's word. This is what they did to ensure that the church will have a better place than the one they're leaving them. Think about what these folks had to endure. But I think about what the folks had to endure 30 years ago for us to be here. They had to submit and commit. Second thing is is to be separate from the ways of the world. This is a hard one for a lot of us because some of us are in the Navy, you're in the military, you know what it's like to be around other sailors, right? You know what it's like to be around those kind of people. Even those of you guys who may not be in the Navy, but you work with them, or even just living in here in general, driving around these roads, man, that will cause you to want to put your salvation down for a moment just to say something to somebody. Like folks don't know how to use blinkers. Like that frustrates me to no end. And I want to put... Come on now, I'm just saying, I'm ready to just go off. I'm like, man, let me pull this car over and say something to them. But I'm like, really? What's... We need to be separate from the world. Because that's what the world does. And then they also committed to keeping the Sabbath day holy. Now, I'm not saying it's Saturday, Sunday, whatever day. I'm not going to get into that whole thing. Just have a day separated, set aside to worship the Lord. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. We just need a day that we can sit and worship God without work, without any other things that's going to hinder or compete against that, but that we could just give God everything. And then the last thing that they commit and they vow to is to support the work of God. Many of you guys have supported the work so far up to this point. We've reached a million and a half souls in the last three years through our global outreach work. But I just want to reach that many people here in our city, in our community. If we can commit to God's work here, we could see that change because then the church will be strong here, therefore can support the church overseas. But the church overseas is not going to be supported unless the church here is strong so that it can support them. And this is what they commit to. So God provides all the resources. God provides everything that we need. We just got to trust him in it. I think if we trust him, God will make that happen. So if we're thinking that we already heard these steps, PJ, it sounds like something you preached last year. Probably has because God's word doesn't change. And we see throughout the generations, he's constantly having to remind them of this. And I think even as the years go by and months go by, I may have to remind you of it too, because if I'm reminding you, it's because we're not doing it, right? And if we're not doing it, and God is giving us his grace so that he's reminding us of, hey, this is what we need to get. You're kind of sliding off, you're veering off. And that's the beautiful thing about God. He's so committed to seeing his children come into a loving relationship with him. If we commit that, then we commit to rebuilding. If we commit to keeping the walls strong, we will see our lives make a difference in the lives of others because they'll have a place that's safe for them to come and gather they were excited because the walls were built and they were safe from the outside enemies, but more importantly, the presence of God can stay there. See, I'm tired of always having to rebuild, and I'm sure many of you guys are tired of having to rebuild, but you wouldn't have to rebuild if you just take care and strengthen what has already been built, and that's what God is calling us to do tonight. I know I didn't get into all of my I only kind of did three verses on Nehemiah, but I believe that those three verses was more than enough, but I encourage you to go back and read this because God is calling us to say, hey, stop rebuilding and take care and fortify what has already been built so that it'd be stronger for the next generation and they can build upon that. But if we continue to break it down and having to rebuild, it's not gonna be nothing strong left for another generation. Let's strengthen what we have so that the other generation can continue to build upon that and we'll see this church flourish and grow, not just today, but as we make the investments for the future. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord God.